it's time for another retro game review in this time of seven go seriously now you're playing with power superpower it's time for for super nintendo entertainment system game review you know the drill we're going with a launch title i could have gone with the classic pack in but nah we can jump on turtles and save a princess at another time besides it's far too soon to abandon the run-on joke about not directly saying the name of that overalls wear in the plumber. So F-Zero it is. And while scouring through some retrospectives and reviews for some reference viewing, because it's tradition now around these parts to link to another creator who's covered the game that I'm about to, I have two for you to watch. Don't worry, they're both quite brief, roughly three minutes each. But both of these reviews I find intriguing. Points that I agree with, points that I don't. And it really fascinates me how they come to two very opposite conclusions over one specific aspect. Anyway, that said, please check out Nintendo Reviewer and SNES Drunk's reviews of this game. Link in the description below. Then come back here for the triple nine prerogative on this futuristic racer. F-Zero is a one-player only futuristic racing game with Grand Prix and practice modes. The practice mode allows you to test out seven of the 15 tracks, either solo or against a lone computer-controlled racer. I'll get back to this later. Grand Prix is the core feature of the game. You compete in Knight, Queen, or King League and select your difficulty. Note that Master difficulty is locked when your game is new. You can unlock that by beating the King League on Expert. Each league consists of five races. It does possess some hints of some arcade-esque aspects in it. You must finish each lap above a certain ranking, indicated near the upper left corner, or you will rank out. For each lap, that requirement gets tighter, until the final lap, which requires you to finish top three to move on. You have limited lives, but can earn one by scoring enough points. Yeah. Points are nearly meaningless at this point in time in home console gaming, but it's a holdover that just won't die. Or won't die quickly. Oh, and even if you're not at risk of ranking out, you can explode. Violently. By incurring too much damage. There is a pit stop slash repair station to help minimize this, and I love that you can get your repairs at full speed, or if you're in dire straits can make a judgment call to slow down and spend more time to get more repaired. You can also explode by falling off the track, or rather, taking a jump and not landing on the track. Okay, now that the introduction is out of the way, let's get on with the review. My youthful experience. As a member of the Super Power Club through Nintendo Power Magazine, I had acquired enough credits and or points to actually get something meaningful. I chose an F-Zero card cartridge. To the best of my recollection, this box came with some gold lettering, where, like, the non-Super Power Club versions had red, but I could be misremembering. Unfortunately, I had sold my original SNES and all my games back around 1997 or so, so I'm unable to reference my childhood copy. But it's okay to have memories, regardless of accuracy. To paraphrase a great moment from the movie Lost Highway, I like to remember things my own way how I remember them, not necessarily how they happened. As an early teen, I absolutely loved this game. The look, the sound, I played it quite a bit. Even remember being really good at it. For your information, a substantial array of my memories of being good at gaming when I was younger got flushed down the hole when I started watching retro streams on Twitch. Anyway, I had developed a style I felt was all my own, but nowadays realize others came to similar conclusions and more devoted players expanded on them to degrees I never would have even imagined. But yeah, my youthful experience with this game, it was abundant, and it was very, very positive. Look. The game looks great. It seems to handle everything it needs to process with little or no slowdown, leg frames. In fact, it's rare to notice any at all until you've unlocked Master difficulty. And even then, the gameplay at that level is so frantic that the subtle leg frame here or there goes mostly unnoticed at the moment. The cars, excluding the generics, look great in the 16-bit graphics. 
The afterburners and various features within the tracks are all looking good. The tracks are completely flat. Guess they weren't ready for hills yet, but a future racing game for the SNES that I do plan to review that did add hills didn't do it very well. So I'll take all the greatness of the look with the slopeless track design with appreciation. It's not like this wasn't more or less the standard of the time after all. The vehicles aren't animated too much, but there are a few subtle traits that make such a difference. The spiels, spells, <coughs> sparks. It's like I'm hardly even trying with this aging joke anymore. The sparks, when you turn while also using the shoulder button, indicating your sides are grinding against the surface. The, the wings, fins, etc. of the cars when you turn. It's nothing amazing. It might even go unnoticed to some. But these are the details that really stand out to me. The game's aesthetics contain such a blend of bland and colorful all throughout the entire game. The background on the horizon is okay. It does have a bit of a feel that you're just racing in a really large room and the walls, miles and miles away, are just painted or wallpapered. Upon close inspection, it is apparent that a very, very subtle amount of parallax is being used. But the amount of attention required to notice this pretty much means you're going to lose the race to appreciate it. If you appreciate it at all. For what it's worth, while playing, the background scrolling parallax effect is negligible. Had it been more pronounced, I feel this would have very nicely completed the wow factor that this game showcases. But then again, we can all just imagine we're driving around in the Truman Show. The city below the track, several hundred feet below, according to the manual, also feels incredibly flat. But the illusion of a vibrant, futuristic city is still conveyed well. Of course, some tracks occur in non-urban locations as well, and these are fine, too. Where the look excels, though, is in the game's ability to make it truly feel that you are going ridiculously fast. Sound. I love it this soundtrack. So many good and classic tunes. My jaw dropped when I heard one of the content creators that I linked to in the description found the music to be not so impressive. Just goes to show that we don't all have to like and dislike the same things. The sound effects are good too. You really think you're getting zapped when you touch the walls. The engine hums are believable. The sound in this regard even adds to the sense of speed. And the crashes. I recently reviewed Pole Position 2 for the 7800 and found some of the crash sounds to be pretty good. And considering the audio limitations of that system, I may amend that to say very good. But F-Zero, with SNES technology, jeez. The sound of these crashes could be spliced into old episodes of Mythbusters, and I bet some non-zero percentage of people watching and listening to it would be none the wiser. Okay, I exaggerated a tad there, but when you meet your fiery doom, the audio makes it crystal clear that you done goofed. As far as Triple Nine is concerned, the audio is fantastic. Gameplay. Each car has its own properties. Top speed, acceleration, handling, etc. I do remember this game as having a bit of a learning curve for getting the hang of, but I'm far beyond that point. And while sometimes when I revisit a childhood game, one that I felt I was good at, as an adult I struggle. This game does not fall into that category. It's like riding a bike, so to speak. Well, for the fire stingray. I appear to be all over the place with Golden Fox, and Blue Falcon and Wild Goose I'm still okay with. My perspective on how the game handles won't be too useful to potential newcomers. I just simply don't recall how long it took me to get acclimated to the game. But once I did, well, it's nearly 30 years later and I'm still pretty comfortable with this game. There are things to get accustomed to, like with all games, but I think if you like racing games and give yourself the time to get decent, you'll find the controls to be great. To me, today, the game doesn't feel like it's trying to cheat me. Except when I do a speed run. Those generic cars that go so painfully slow that you lap always seem to spawn in the worst possible locations. This is generally overcomable if you're just trying to beat the game, 
but in an RTA attempt, they get quite frustrating. If you're okay with that, or at the very least, accept it, then the game does a great job of playing by its own rules, and you don't get cheated. Of course, just hours after writing this script, this happened. Oh! Wait, what? I had a lot of power. I'm not sure exactly what caused this to result in a crash out, but this game has been explored in so much detail I'm sure it's not an unknown feature. Still, I do stand by my statement that this game doesn't cheat you. Usually. So the gameplay is good. Some vehicles handle better than others, but it's nearly unanimous that Fire Stingray is the superior car. But give them all a shot. You may not like the slower acceleration of that one, especially at first when you find yourself losing speed frequently. Also under the gameplay umbrella, the first several times you play Deathwind 2, you may be in for a brutal awakening. But even that crazy track becomes navigable with time, patience, and practice. Other. One of the best parts about the practice feature is Port Town 2. There happens to be a jump you can use, in conjunction with your SJ, to skip a section of track. It's very risky, very difficult, and might not even save much time. But it's exhilarating to pull it off. Every time I try it, I go through the same series of emotions of Homer Simpson while he jumped Springfield Gorge on Bart's skateboard. This would be a significantly longer process to try out if Port Town could only be accessed in Grand Prix mode. Of course, in the emulator era, and with this game available with save states on Wii U and Switch, heck, even on original hardware with the Naki Tech, this feature holds less importance in the modern age. The one-player experience. Being a one-player only game, I think we can move on to the next segment. Relevance today. The F-Zero brand doesn't seem to have much by the way of new games these days. While I speculate on this matter, I feel like anyone who would buy an F-Zero title would be fine with buying a mustachioed plumber cart video game. But the reverse would not be empirically true. The brand lives on through the marketability of Captain Falcon, which is awesome, but it does also sad me that the legacy may be left in the dust. But that's the brand as a whole. This specific title gets re-released on Virtual Console and their equivalents quite regularly. Nintendo knows it's still a hit. So much so that F-Zero 99 is currently a thing at the time of this record. This is a testament to how good it is. It stands on its own merit. The CPU has rubber banding AI, which is generally a mainstay in most racers at this point in time. Aside from S-Jets, it doesn't really have any items and certainly doesn't have any lottery-based item handout system designed to punish skilled players and reward unskilled ones. The satisfaction you get from recovering from a mistake to win the race, and by doing so on nothing but your own merit, should not be scoffed at. And knowing you earned your ranked out or you lost or crashed out, rather than getting it because a worse racer used an item on you, just motivates you to get better. There is no magic wand in F-Zero to help you or harm you. The magic lies entirely within the enjoyment of the game. Who would like this? This is a game I would consider a must-have for SNES owners. Exceptions would include people that aren't fans of racing games, or that rare subset of individuals that enjoy a racer but don't like the behind-the-driver POV. It's a launch title for the system, but really, it holds up to the test of time, and I would have no problem calling it one of the titles that defines this console. And when I say that, it holds meaning, because, in my opinion, the SNES has the best library of any console I've ever owned. Overall. This is a great, great, great game. The biggest criticism is lack of two-player functionality. For me personally, that's basically irrelevant, as I've mentioned in the past that nearly all of my gaming is done in solitude. But as a 16-bit, one-player, behind-the-driver, POV racer, this game is excellent. I won't go so far as to call it a masterpiece, and I'll reserve that designation for other titles on this console. 
but this is a game I love to go back to and revisit time and time again. There will always be an ability to improve your best times. So if you haven't played this for a while, go ahead and treat yourself to some nostalgia. And if you haven't played this ever, what are you waiting for? Next. Who's in the mood to see review after review of the same game, but ported to different platforms? Well, too bad that's not next. But it is in the works. I'm sure it will be barrels of fun. Before we get to that, I'd like to tackle another retro racing title. And this one was retro when F-Zero was new. See you next mission.